You are probably already familiar with potentiometric methods of analysis. These would include measurements with pH electrodes and other ion-selective electrodes. With these types of devices, we insert a sensor, along with a second electrode to complete the circuit, into a sample solution and measure the voltage that develops at the sensor as ions in solution come into equilibrium with the surface of the device. A pH electrode uses selective absorption of hydrogen ions onto the surface of a special glass membrane. The amount of charge that absorbs onto the surface depends on the concentration of ions in solution. The concentration on the inside of the bulb is kept constant, so the charge that absorbs there is also a constant. Ions in the outer solution come into equilibrium with the outside surface. A difference in hydrogen ion activity in the two solutions leads to a difference in charge on the two sides of the glass membrane, and therefore a voltage difference across the membrane. A potential can also develop at a metal surface, such as a silver wire, if it is placed in contact with an aqueous solution containing a fixed concentration of silver ions. In this case, electrons are transferred between the metal surface and ions in solution until an equilibrium is reached. The potential that develops on the surface is a direct function of the silver ion concentration, or more properly, the silver ion activity in solution, as described by the Nernst equation. In this lesson, we're going to look at a number of electrochemical methods of analysis that are based on applying a voltage to an electrode surface to force an electron transfer reaction to take place. Here we deliberately push the system away from its equilibrium or resting state and monitor the rate of the reaction that occurs in response. We call these controlled potential electrochemical methods. One subset of this group is called voltammetry. Voltammetry involves scanning the voltage and monitoring the current. Voltammetry is the electrochemical equivalent to visible spectroscopy. In spectroscopy, we plot the wavelength or energy of the light that is applied to the sample on the horizontal axis and the intensity or function of the intensity of light on the vertical axis. Intensity is measured in photons per second, so that is a rate measurement. So it is giving us quantitative information, while the position on the horizontal axis gives us qualitative information. The wavelength at the maximum of the peak is related to the electronic structure of the analyte. It can help us identify the analyte or get information about its environment. Now let's consider a voltage scan. We'll plot the energy going into the system as the applied voltage on the electrode. We'll plot the current response in the vertical direction. Current is measured in charges transferred per second, so like intensity, current is a measure of rate. Therefore, we're also getting quantitative information from the vertical axis. In some types of voltammetry, we observe peaks in the current. Other forms of voltammetry produces waves. These experiments, the position of these events along the voltage axis is related to the electronic structure of the analyte. In some spectroscopic work, we hold the wavelength and monitor the signal as a function of time, such as with a UV detector in an HPLC. The parallel experiment in electrochem would be to hold the applied voltage at a fixed value and monitor the current. We call this variation amperometry is integrated to get the charge that's transferred. This is attractive because the charge is proportional to the number of moles of the analyte that has been oxidized or reduced. When we measure the charge in an electrochemical experiment, the method is called coulometry. Let's go back and reconsider the shape of these current voltage curves. Here's a platinum wire to act as a working electrode. Consider a simple reduction of an iron-3 complex with one electron to iron-2 complex. For now, let's not concern ourselves about the ligand and any influence that it has on the chemistry of the iron. We'll just assume that this is a simple electron transfer process where the iron-3 complex accepts an electron from the electrode and to form the iron-2 complex. Current is measured in coulombs per second, so it represents a rate measurement. The rate constant for the reduction process is an exponential function of the applied voltage to the electrode. K0 is called the standard heterogeneous rate constant. It is merely the value that the rate constant would have at a particular standard state that we arbitrarily choose, that being 
when the applied voltage is set equal to the formal potential for this reaction. N is the number of electrons that are transferred in the balanced half reaction. E0 prime is the formal potential for the electrode reaction. And E is the voltage we're imposing from an outside circuit on the electrode. R is the ideal gas constant. Really using gases, it shows up here because it's really the product of Boltzmann's constant times Avogadro's number. The temperature here is in kelvins. The alpha value is the electron transfer coefficient. It appears here because not all of the energy that is put into the system in form of the applied voltage goes into lowering the activation energy for the reaction. We think about the rate of a reaction being controlled by the activation energy barrier formed by the two energy wells that describe the reactants and products. The delta G for activation is the exponential term in our equation for the rate constant. The difference in energy for the bottom of the well for the reactants and the point where the two wells cross is the activation energy barrier. When we apply a more negative potential to the electrode, we are raising the free energy of the electrons in the electrode, so the potential well for the reactants shifts up. The energy barrier gets smaller, but not by the same amount of energy that we put in. It's discounted. The energy barrier is lowered only by a fraction of the applied voltage. Alpha is that fraction. Its value is between 0 and 1, usually about 0.5. So let's try graphing this thought experiment. So on a current voltage graph, let's imagine that the formal potential appears about here. The graph of our rate constant should look something like this. Let's scan the voltage in a quiet, unstirred solution. We might expect the current to follow the red curve, but it doesn't. Not only does it fail to keep up, the current actually begins to drop off. Early on, it appears to follow the rate of the electron transfer, but later it doesn't. Why not? The problem is that there's more than one step in our overall process. The rate for the overall process depends upon the rate determining step. The conversion from iron 3 to iron 2 involves not only the electron transfer process, but also the mass transport of material to the surface. As the electron transfer gets faster and faster, it eventually catches up and supersedes the mass transport process. When we convert some of the iron 3 to iron 2 at the surface, we need to bring more iron 3 into the surface to replenish the used reactant. The concentration of the reactant drops a little bit at the electrode surface fresh reactant has to come from a little bit further out than it did before. Since we're doing this in an unstirred solution, the mass transport depends entirely on diffusion. With time, this depletion zone grows even further into the solution. The mass transport process can't keep up, and so the current begins to drop. At any point in time, we might characterize the depletion zone as the distance from the surface to the roll-off in the concentration versus distance curve. This is known as the diffusion layer thickness and also called the depletion zone thickness. The current is inversely proportional to the diffusion layer thickness. Diffusion layer thickness changes with time. The current drops with time. Although this limits sensitivity, something very useful also results. Starting material is being depleted, but product is building up at the electrode surface. What happens if we turn around now and scan back in the other direction? Now we see the current moving in the opposite direction. Once again, since we're not replenishing iron 2 except by diffusion, the current peaks out and eventually tapers off. We call this sort of experiment a cyclic voltammetry experiment. As we go more positive, we eventually get to a point where we can convert the iron 2 back to the iron 3 starting material. The peak current for the forward reaction is proportional to the concentration of the starting material. It is also proportional to the voltage scan rate to the one-half power. 
This relationship has been used in a number of situations, such as monitoring the concentration of dopamine and other neurotransmitter molecules at the synapse for neurons in brain experiments. Notice that this duck-like profile is somewhat symmetric about the formal potential. In fact, the average of the peak potentials is a fairly good estimate of the formal potential for the redox couple. I say estimate because it actually depends upon the diffusion coefficients for the oxidize and reduce forms, but these are usually very close to each other. So the ratio approaches 1 and the log term approaches 0. Cyclic voltammetry, then, is the method of choice for estimating standard or formal potentials. One other advantage is the fact that you only need one form, either the oxidized or reduced species, not both, to do the experiment. One of the ways of increasing the sensitivity in voltammetry is to stir the solution. In cyclic voltammetry, we depended upon diffusion to bring the reactant to the electrode surface. As a result, the diffusion layer thickness continues to grow with time and the signal drops. We can increase the current by making the depletion zone thickness thinner and constant. All we have to do is stir the solution. For example, we can use a rotated disk electrode that draws the solution toward the surface in a well-characterized manner. This keeps the concentration of reactant nearly equal to the bulk solution concentration up to a very thin layer at the electrode surface. Not only is this layer thin, it is also constant over time. For a rotated disk electrode, the current is proportional to the square root of the rotation rate. For a flow-through electrode, as you might have in an HPLC detector, the current is proportional to the cube root of the flow rate. Both of these convective electrodes give a wave-like current voltage curve. The mass transport limited plateau provides a sensitive signal for quantitative analysis.